So our scripture reading today will be from Luke 22, 47 through 65. Now, while he was still speaking, suddenly a mob came and one of the 12 named Judas was leading them. He came near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? When those around him saw what was going to happen, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. But Jesus responded, no more of this. And touching his ear, he healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, temple police, and the elders who had come for him, have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a criminal? Every day while I was with you in the temple, you never laid a hand on me. But this is your hour in the dominion of darkness. They seized him, led him away, and brought him into the high priest's house. Meanwhile, Peter was following at a distance. They lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, and Peter sat among them. When a servant saw him sitting in the light and looked closely at him, she said, This man was with him too, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him. After a little while, someone else saw him and said, You're one of them too. Man, I am not, Peter said. About an hour later, another kept insisting, This man was certainly with him, since he's also a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. Then the Lord turned and looked at Peter. So Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. The men who were holding Jesus started mocking and beating him. After blindfolding him, they kept asking, Prophesy! Who was it that hit you? And they were saying many other blasphemous things to him. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning, church. It's good to see you and be with you uh, this morning as we continue through the Gospel of Luke and through this uh, passion narrative. Uh, why, do, why do bad things happen? It's a, it's a question that I think is relevant to all of our lives. Life often seems uh, out of control. Life, life often seems uh, random. You can probably look back at at your life and, and uh, events that have happened and, and ask why. What, what, what's the purpose of this? I think everyone has, these, uh, everyone has these events in their life. Everyone has these questions. I, I can look back at my life. I, I lived uh, overseas for a year. I was, I was dating my now wife, Caroline. And, uh, and I, I, lived over, I lived apart from her for a year. Long distance relationships, if anyone has ever done that, they really stink. Um, and I, I, I fell into a, a pretty deep depression, and I, I don't know why. I, I, I still look back. I've tried to look back and go, well, what was the purpose of that, Lord? And I, I don't know. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, Caroline and I had a, a pretty difficult miscarriage. And we look back, and it was a thought in my head, like, why, why? Why would you allow that, Lord? What good possibly could come out of this? And if you look at this story on its face from a human perspective, I think you can ask the same question. What good could come out of this? An, an innocent man is praying in private. Right? He's, 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 he's just praying with his friends. And another of his friends brings a violent mob and comes and arrests him. He's betrayed. He's arrested. Right? He, he, uh, he, he's, he, when he's arrested, his friends scatter and, and his, his best friend, his most loyal friend, says, I, I don't even know him, denies him. And he's blindfolded and mocked and beaten. I'd say, man, what good could come out of this? From a human perspective, it's, it's all just bad. It's all just evil. But I want to press in a little more even to this because I, the, our, our modern worldview, our modern, secular, Western, materialist worldview, right? The, the worldview, the, the perspective that we all swim in all the time. 
I, I think it is particularly bad uh, at, at handling suffering. Tim Keller says this in his book on suffering. He's, he talks about all the world religions. Every religion has some way to deal with suffering. Modern, secular, materialist Western people don't. Right? And the reason is, is this, because if, if the worldview is, hey, what, what's, the only thing that's real is what you can see and taste and touch and smell, right? It's, it's only what you can experience with your senses, right? God, faith, heaven, hell, angels, demons, all, all this stuff. Yeah, this, I mean, if, if that's helpful for you to believe that psychologically, then go ahead. But it doesn't, that doesn't have any objective reality like the chair you're sitting in does, right? The, the real things are the physical things and everything else is imaginary, honestly, Right, they, they, the modern worldview removes a personal creator, right? A personal uh, God who created everything. And with that, right, with that, you lose a purpose. You lose the, the telos, the meaning, the goal, the end, right? There, there isn't, in, in the modern worldview, there, there isn't any goal. Everything, right, if you, if you, when, you, when you remove a personal creator, everything now is simply random, we are a random collection of atoms in a, in a random universe, in a random planet that happened to sustain life. We're, we're, a, we're really a, a scientific miracle, they would say. I mean, if you look, even the, 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 you know, the science is now going to like, how, how do we explain how the, the low probability of, of our planet actually existing? Well, look, maybe it's multiverse, right? <laughs> you go to all these different things to explain it. But, but at the end, what is the, what is the modern materials world? You say, we are all, we're all destined, right? What's going to happen? The, the, the sun's going to burn out. Entropy is going to have its way. Uh, everyone will die. The, the planet will cease to exist. And no one will remember. It's all random. It's all an accident. And so every single event, every single thing that happens has the same significance, exactly zero. You see a child dying or a pine cone being crunched. The same thing. Both don't matter at all. Because what? Because everything is going to be blurred up. What, what does it matter? There's no. There's no meaning. There's no purpose. Irving Yalom uh, is a famous uh, psychiatrist, and he says, from the, the the humanistic, the materialist worldview, he says, the existential dilemma of being a human is that you're a being who searches for meaning and certainty in a universe that has neither. It just doesn't exist. And so it's, it's not just from a human perspective that, that, that the, 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 the modern worldview has a, a, a worse answer than Christianity to, to suffering and evil. It's not just that it's a worse answer. I think it is a worse answer. It's not just that, though. It's that there isn't an answer. The modern worldview cannot give us an answer for evil and suffering. There is no purpose to it. There can't be, it cannot be found. From the human, simply human perspective, there is no answer to evil and to suffering. So what, what's the way forward? Well, I, I think sometimes we need a, an outside perspective. Right? And I think we know this. It's why a, a friend or a counselor or a therapist is often very helpful, right? To, to, to listen to you and say, have you thought of it? But I, I see what you're saying, but have you thought of it from this way? I don't think you're, you're seeing the situation in the right light. We need an outside perspective. But if there's no, if there's no answer for, for suffering from a human perspective, how do we get an outside perspective? We're all humans. How do we get a, a perspective from outside of ourselves? And this is where the Bible comes in. This is where the Bible comes in. The Bible is a human book in that it was written by people. It's written in human language. We can understand it in words and images that we can understand. But it's more than a human book. Because men wrote as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit led and, and, and breathed out the words of Scripture. And so when, in, the, in the Bible we have, amazingly, in our, in, our, in our language, in human language, we have revelation. We have words from God. We actually have a perspective from outside of the world. We have a perspective from outside of humanity. We have the perspective from the Creator. And so I want to look today at the Bible's perspective on these events that are happening, these terrible events that are happening 
And I think uh, the, 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 the question of why do bad things happen, I, I think it is relevant to, uh, to answering this question, why bad things are happening to a good person in this instance, in this uh, telling that Luke tells us today. And so let's pray, uh, and then we'll, we'll jump in to the, to the text today. Take a moment uh, where you are to uh, just ask God to speak to you today. Would you also pray for your neighbor, someone around you, someone on your row, um, that God would speak to them today? And lastly, would you pray for me? Uh, that I would be faithful to God's word and that I would be helpful to you this morning. Father, you know that we need you. We have nothing without you. You know that I have no power in my words to change anyone's heart. Lord, you know that you, you, but you know, you know exactly what each, where each person is in this room, exactly where they are in their lives, exactly what, what they need to hear, exactly if they need to be encouraged, if they need challenging, if they need convicting, if they need uh, comforting. Lord, would you, would you do uh, what you do, would you minister to your people by your word today and, and through your Holy Spirit? We need you. We love you. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> today, we'll, we'll look at uh, four different movements of the text. Betrayed, arrested, uh, denied, mocked, and beaten. First, uh, betrayed. Betrayed. Uh, this, this happens at the very beginning of the text, verse 47. While he was still speaking, suddenly a mob came, and one of the 12 named Judas was leading them. He came near Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Jesus is praying in the garden. We saw last week. Uh, he's gone out after the meal. It's, it's nighttime. It's, it's late at night. Uh, he, he's in the, the he's on the Mount of Olives in the garden, uh, and and he's he's praying. Judas has sold him out, right? Judas knows where Jesus is going to be. Uh, he's promised to bring the leaders to Jesus at a, at a time when uh, he, he's alone, at a time when when he's not with the crowds because they feared the crowds and what they would say. And so suddenly a, a mob shows up. Or Judas, Judas is leading them, and, and they, they, the mob has this problem. It's nighttime. It's, it's, you know, they're in a garden with trees and stuff. And so uh, you, you got to think that the, the, uh, the chief priests, the, the scribes, the leaders were saying, what if he just melts into the trees? What if he, you know, there, there's a, a crowd of them. How, what, how do we make sure that he doesn't get away? That we know, and, and then we know which one he is. All the Galileans look the same. Like, what do we, how do we tell, uh, how, how do we know and make sure we, we get the right guy? And Judas says, oh, he must have said, oh, I, I know. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go greet him, right? I'll go give him a kiss, the kiss of greeting right away. Um, and then you'll know who it is. You can grab him. Uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, I lived overseas for a little while in a, in a Muslim country. And so I, I know about the, the kiss, right? The, the kiss of, of greeting. Um, it's, it's similar to a, how we would kind of between like a handshake and a hug that we would, uh, how we would use. You know, everyone, if you're sitting at dinner, there's 10 people there. So a new person comes, they'll go around and 
you know, kiss everyone on both cheeks, each person. And then the same thing, when some, if you're sitting there and someone leaves, stand up, they go kiss everyone around, right? It, it's, 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 a, it's a greeting, but it's, a clo- it's closer than that. In a relational uh, culture, uh, it's, it's, you know, if you're friends with someone, your family, your, your brothers, your sisters, like you, you, there's this relational closeness. And so there's just this poignant moment when, when uh, Judas comes near to Jesus to kiss him. And Jesus says to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? A sign of, of relational closeness, diabolically used to betray the very Son of Man. Notice, though, no, notice Jesus' uh, his, his response here. And I think this is, you know, throughout this, throughout this passage, isn't it amazing that we see Jesus seems to be so in control, right? We, we just saw in, in, in the garden, he was crushed when considering what he was about to endure, considering that he was going to drink the cup of the wrath of God, he was crushed. Right? But, but when he moves in, and, and as he submits, right, what do, you, what do you see him say? Not my will, but yours be done. In that submission, he had, he had great strength, right? This strengthened him for the task at hand. He was ready now to obey. And, and what he says here to Judas is interesting uh, in that he predicts what Judas is doing before he even does it. Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Before he even kisses him, is listen, I, I know what you're doing here. I know what you're doing. And hadn't Jesus already predicted this? Back in chapter nine, while everyone was amazed at all the things uh, he, he was doing, he told them, let these words sink in. The son of man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. And then simply hours earlier at the Last Supper in Luke 22, but look, the hand of the one betraying me is at the table with me. For the Son of Man will go away as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Jesus knew this was coming. He predicted this. Even as it's happening, he's, he's telling Judas what's happening Would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? He's betrayed by one of the inner circle, by one of his closest friends. Next, he's arrested. When those around him saw what was going to happen, verse 49, they ask, Lord, should we strike with a sword? You remember uh, remember, uh, two weeks ago uh, when Jesus had mentioned swords to the disciples and they had totally misunderstood him. They're like, yeah, we got two swords. He's like, Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, well, they, they bring it up again. Lord, should we strike with the sword? This is, an, this is a tense moment. There's a mob. There's, they have weapons. They have torches. They, 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 this is you know, a, a tense and violent moment. And one of them uh, struck the high priest's ear, servant's ear and cut it off, cut off his right ear. Now, uh, we, we know helpfully from uh, the, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't tell us who it was. John, helpfully, John's like, I'll just say it. It was Peter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Peter struck with a sword. Uh, and uh, uh, man, it, you know, the commentators kind of talk, talk about, um, you know, Peter, may, maybe he wasn't a great swordsman. That's like, oh, he's going to deal this, this fatal blow. Like, no, he, he just got the ear, you know. Uh, he wasn't Zorro or anything. Uh, but he... Uh, but he, he, he strikes out, he strikes out and that, I mean, that's an intense moment. As a mob comes up, someone pulls out a sword and cuts off someone's ear. I mean, this is, it, this is escalating quickly. But Jesus, again, just notice his, his demeanor. Jesus responded, no more of this, right? Stops it. And touching his ear, he healed him. Right? And what an amazing, this is Jesus' last healing miracle in the Gospels. To, to uh, a servant, right? A servant whose ear got, a servant of his enemies whose ear got cut off. John also tells us the name. This is, this is, this is Malchus, this is the, the servant's name, which is a wonderful detail. I love it uh, because it just it shows, I think, the gospel's 
the historicity of these things, right? If you're, if you're making up a story, you don't say, yeah, the enemy servant's name was Malchus. He got his ear cut off. Because if you're in Jerusalem, what do you go? You go, well, I know someone who knows the temple servants. Let me ask him if Malchus got his ear cut off, right? It's a very easy thing to verify. And Jesus says no. And in, in compassion, right, as, as he has, has shown throughout his ministry, what does he do? Does he pick up the ear off the ground and put it back on? Does he just touch it? I, I don't know, but he heals the servant. He heals him. And Jesus said to the chief priests, temple police, and the elders who had come for him, have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a criminal? Right? Am I a bandit? You, 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 are you threatened by, my, by that I'm going to react in violence? Listen, I just healed your guy. Every day while I was with you in the temple, you never laid a hand on me. But this is your hour and the dominion of darkness. He's just pointing out, hey, there, there's something sinister going on here. I, I've, been in, I've been, every day I've been in the temple. I've been right under your noses. You, you've known where I'm not hiding from you, but all of a sudden you show up at night when no one's around. But this is your hour, and this is the dominion of darkness. Again, Jesus knows this is coming. In fact, he said it would happen, right? Back in Luke 9, 22. It is necessary that the Son of Man suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, be killed and raised on the third day. It is necessary. This must happen. This will happen. This is predicted. Jesus is arrested. His only crime, speaking out against, uh, against authority that's abusing its power. No crime at all. In fact, we'll see they have trouble charging him. They have to kind of figure out how do we, how do we pin him down? We don't really have anything. But he's arrested. Next, he's denied. Verse 54, they seized him, led him away, brought him into the high priest's house. Meanwhile, Peter was following at a distance. They lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together. And Peter sat down among them. When a servant saw him sitting in the light and looked closely at him, she said, this man was with him too. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him. So Peter is, is, is following. And we know from the other gospel, when, when Jesus was arrested, the disciples ran. They, they ran away. They, did, they didn't want to be arrested as well. Right? Some people say that's, what, that's actually one of the reasons probably Jesus healed the servant was to say, Hey, because obviously Peter would be arrested if he's attacking people. Uh, hey, let them go, right? But Peter's following along, right? And they bring, they take him to the, they take him to the, the high priest's house. Uh, there, there's, uh, and kind of the, the, you know, camera pans out and we see there's a, a fire in the courtyard, right? This is at night, it's probably cool. Uh, and so the, the servants and, and the other sold, the people who had come in the mob to get Jesus probably out just waiting now, waiting, uh, for, you know, um, to see what happens. And they're out sitting around the fire and, and Peter's trying to blend in, right? He's, 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 fo he's followed along, he's gotten in uh, and, and he's, well, he wants to see what's gonna happen. He wants to uh, be there, you know, with Jesus, for Jesus. And so he's there in, in the courtyard and a servant girl sees him and says, you were with him. This man was with him. Right? And Peter denies him, right? I, I'm gonna keep my, keep my cover, right? No, 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 it's not me, right? I don't, I don't know him. After a little while, someone else saw him, verse 58, and said, you're one of them too. Man, I am not, Peter said. Right? So someone asks again, brings it up again. Aren't you, aren't you one of his followers? No, I'm not. About an hour later, verse 59, Another kept, and, and, and you know, maybe Peter in that hour, he thought, okay, whew, dodge that bullet. Like, it's going to be okay. I've, I've, they, they don't suspect me anymore. An hour later, another kept insisting. This is, a, they're, you know, repetitive. 
this man was certainly with him since he's also a Galilean. He, he, his accent gives him away. He's from Galilee, of course. And what are you doing here then? You're, you're, you're one of his, his followers. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. The other gospels add that he, he used a string of oaths, right? He used some choice language to, to say, no, I don't know. I'm not, I don't know him. Immediately, a rooster crowed. Right, and, and, and again, it, just put this in, try to put, you know, put yourself in the story. Just imagine that you're like your closest friend, right? Peter is, is Jesus' closest, most loyal, right? <laughs> most loyal disciple. The one who would say, I will go to, de- I, will, I will never deny you. They can all deny you. I will never deny you. So imagine your closest friend, the one you trust and, and love the most. And imagine you're at your house and the cops pull up and they, they start arresting you. You don't know why. They're just arresting you. And at that, that exact time, your, your best friend, your closest friend in the world pulls up in front of your house. And someone asks, oh, do you, do you know this? You know, you, do you know you? And they're like, nope. No, I just stopped to see what the police were doing. No, I don't. No, no idea. What? Betrayed. And there's this this is a chilling, uh, the sin shivers down my spine. Then the Lord, verse 61, turned and looked at Peter. You gotta imagine throughout the night, Peter, he was sitting by the fire and he was constantly looking up, constantly looking at the house, looking, looking okay, Jesus, tracking, Jesus, okay, he's out with the soldiers now, okay, they took him in, okay, he's, he's, in, he's, he's being questioned now, okay, he's back out, he's waiting. Like, they're, he, like trying not to look too much, you know, not to be, to attract too much attention, but, uh, but keeping, keeping tabs on it, you know, and, and then he's being accused and he's talking to people around him and then he looks back up and we don't know where Jesus was. Was he in a room looking out? Was he standing by a torch? We don't know. But, but they lock eyes from, from a distance. And he remembers. So Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he realizes what he's done. And he went outside, it says, and he wept bitterly. He had done what he said he would never do. Only a couple hours after he said he would never do it. Have you ever been so broken by your sin that you go outside and weep bitterly? All, all sin is, is, in a way, denying Jesus, isn't it? It's denying his presence. Denying, it's, it's, it's denying that he is with you. He sees you. He knows you. He loves you. What do we do when we sin? We choose to ignore that. We choose to, to pretend like that is not tr- the truth. Pretend even that we don't even know him. We have no obligation to him. Have you had a moment in prayer when you, when you lock eyes with Jesus, in a sense, right? When, when all of a sudden, you're before him, you, you realize and you go, oh, oh. You realize what you've done. Peter's denials are to his shame. They are. But, but Peter's weeping, I think, is to his credit. He realizes what he's done. And he's sorrowful. And he weeps bitterly. Thankfully, this is not the end of Peter's story. But, but don't we see here, Jesus is denied by his closest friend, <laughs> right? By his closest disciple. But, but he, he, he knew it would happen. It was, it was, he, had, he foretold it. He prophesied, didn't he? Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. I've prayed for you, Peter. I've prayed for you that your faith would not fail. When you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. He's denied. Lastly, Jesus is mocked and beaten. 
He's mocked and beaten. The men who were holding Jesus standing started mocking and beating him. After blindfolding him, they kept asking, prophesy, who was it that hit you? And they were saying many other blasphemous things to him. It's hard to even picture this, it's hard to imagine this. Right, but this, this crowd, these, uh, the, these people, the, these soldiers, these, the, the temple police, the priests, the elders who are holding him, they begin to, to mock him. They, they, they know he said he was a prophet. He, you know, oh, he's, he's, he's from God. He's a prophet. Okay, well, they, so they blindfold him and they start mocking and, and playing a game with him. Right, punch him in the stomach. Who hit you, prophet? If you're from God, surely you know. Kick him in the groin. Who was that? Who kicked you? Bloody his nose. A blindfolded, innocent man. Who punched you? Jesus. They were saying many other blasphemous things and things Luke doesn't care to repeat. But notice, even, even in this mocking, right, they're mocking him. They're, they're saying, if you're a prophet, then tell who hit me. But even as, as they are mocking him, they themselves are fulfilling prophecy. What did Jesus say back in Luke chapter 18? He took the 12 aside and told them, see, we are going up to Jerusalem. Everything that is written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles. He will be mocked, insulted, spit on. And, they, and after they flog him, they will kill him. and He will rise on the third day. Even in their mocking him as a prophet, they're only proving that he actually is a prophet. That he actually is the one who foretold that this very thing would happen. Jesus is betrayed. He's arrested. He's denied. He's mocked. And he's beaten. From a human perspective, it's all, what's the point? And yet from the biblical perspective, we can see this is all foretold. Jesus himself said all this would happen, and it happens. So why? Why are bad things happening to a good person here? Why are these things occurring? Well, in John's account, he gives us a little more detail. After Peter cuts off the, the high priest servant's ear, Jesus says to Peter, this is John 18, 11, put your sword away. Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? Why is this happening? Like we saw last week in the garden, Jesus had decided, he had submitted to his father's will. He had submitted to the plan and he had said, I will drink the cup of the wrath of God. I'm going. That's why I came. Why, why are all these bad things happening? Because for love, because he loves us. To glorify his grace by saving people, by saving sinners for himself. It's it always been the plan. Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And one as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. We esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God. And afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep gone astray 
We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Why are these bad things happening to a good person? All for love, to redeem his people. Maybe you're here, and you don't have a loving relationship with God. Maybe, maybe you've, you've had a hard life. And, you, and maybe you struggle even to experience love, even to open yourself up to, to, to love. Perhaps you feel that no, no one's ever given you anything. Can, can you see what Jesus has given you today? Can, can you see? Can, can you open your heart up to, to the love of God? Do you see he did this? He suffered this for you. God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Can you open your heart to him? Why do bad things happen? Why do bad things happen? We don't know. <laughs> we, we don't know. The Bible doesn't give us, actually, an immediately satisfying answer. But it does give us what our modern materialist worldview fails to. It gives us an ultimately satisfying hope and the resources to live in the midst of sorrow and struggle. Right? Be, because bad things happen to a good man, because Jesus suffered in the way that he did, we have an answer. We have an answer to suffering from outside of the world. First, the, the, the hope, the ultimately satisfying hope. Right? We don't know why specific things happen to specific people. Right? That, that's what we can't answer. And, and anyone who tries to answer that, I just think, God, it seems foolish. Right? It's not, it's not wise. How, how do we, we don't know. We, we don't know the plan of God. <laughs> He's much wiser than we are. We are so limited. But, but listen, if the most heinous evil imaginable happened, right? If, if the perfect man, Jesus, the only one who didn't deserve any suffering, if he suffered as he did, and from that, from the most heinous evil came the most r remarkable good, right? The redemption of mankind, the forgiveness of sins, then, then how can I say that nothing good could come from my suffering? How can you say that nothing good could come from your suffering? And perhaps the, 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 the biblical perspective can give us some hope, right? Because resurrection does follow death. Right? Perhaps, in fact, this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. But perhaps God, in fact, works all things for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Christianity and the Bible also gives us resources to... to walk through suffering, to walk through pain and sorrow. Because, because, and Christian, brother or sister, you may not know why you suffer. You may not know the specifically why this happened. You may, you may not know till glory. You may, not, you may not have a good reason. But we do know something. We do know something that allows us to eliminate <laughs> one of, one of the, the, the options. We, we know beyond all doubt that he loves us. Right? I, think, I think this is a temptation is to think, man, this has happened in my life, and th this is just God's, it's just his punishment. It's his wrath. It's, it was my, it's because of what I did. He's, he's, he's punishing me. But listen, Christian, we know bad things don't happen because God is angry with us. It's not wrath for what you've done. Why? Because Jesus drank the cup of the wrath of God. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
Right? So everything that comes in your life comes through and from the hand of a loving father. It's not his wrath. Jesus was punished for you, so you don't have to be. And just because we can't see a reason for the suffering in our lives doesn't mean there isn't one. Let let the Bible's perspective inform your own. Let him teach you how to look at reality. We we don't, we're we're limited. We we see things dimly. We, We can't understand. Lift your eyes to the one who suffered for you. Remember his agony. Remember his shame. Remember his cross. And remember his empty tomb. He loves you. He he is with you. He's enough. Brother or sister, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. As it is written, because of you, we are being killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for we thank you for your perspective, for your revelation that you have shown us what is what is true. You've given us a lens to interpret reality outside of our own. Thank you for what you teach us about suffering. Thank you for the hope that we have in suffering because Jesus, you entered into into suffering and you suffered on our behalf. Jesus, why you would why you would come and, and submit yourself to the chastisement, to the abuse, to the mocking death (laughs) why would you do that Lord why would you love us like that how can how can you love us like that after what we've done but we thank you Lord for the person in here who doesn't have hope in you would you give it to them? Would you break down whatever barriers are in their heart? Would you soften hearts of stone? Would you break through uh, walls built up around hearts, hearts that, that are afraid to love, hearts that are afraid to receive love? Would you shine your light into the dark, darkest places? We love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name.